Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Halal Gap. I'm your co-host, Skandar Thiek, and I'm joined, as always, by Sophia Lani and our producer, Asif. For those who don't know, Asif is a TikTok superstar whose content you've got to check out. Asif, where can people find your work? Uh, they can find me at SIFQ. It's S-I-F-Q, four letters. Thanks for the plug. You got it, man. Awesome. If you guys have enjoyed our episodes of The Halal Gap so far and want to make sure not to miss the next, next one, please follow us on Apple and Spotify and leave us a review. If you're watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe to our channel. We have an incredible guest joining us today. Take it away, Sophia. She is a storyteller, nonprofit executive, and educator who's lent her expertise as a creative consultant on Hulu's hit show, Rami. She is also an organizer and abolitionist at Chicago Regional Organizers for Anti-Racism and the managing director of Culture Change at Pillars Fund, an organization that seeks to amplify the leadership, narratives, and talents of Muslims in America. Joining us all the way from Chicago, please welcome Arij Mikati. Woo! So diving right in, um, usually we like to start with kind of you just telling us a little bit about yourself um, and you can start right at the beginning if you would like and kind of tell us about, uh, you know, where you were born and kind of how your upbringing went and all of that jazz. Wow. <laughs> just right at the beginning. Yeah, no big right deal. at the start. Uh, <laughs> so um, I was born in Tripoli, Lebanon, which is a northern port city in Lebanon. Um, it's a very heavily Sunni city. Uh, Lebanon is sort of an interesting place in the Middle East because it's it's very, very religiously diverse. It's about half Sunni and half Shia. And then you've got also like the other half is like all Maronite. And so it's a really, really um, diverse spot um, with other kind of minority religions as well. And um, I was born at the end of the Civil War. Uh, in Lebanon and that my parents had grown up in and fallen in love in and gotten married in and decided like in all that hope to still bring a child into this world, which I try to remember now as we like, face, <laughs> like extraordinary, like climate change and a bunch of other issues that like people before us had hope. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, my family, because we we're at the end of the civil war, uh, my dad, you know, did the thing that a lot of immigrants do, which is that they say, well, you know, the opportunity isn't that great here now. So why don't we just like do a quick skedaddle over to America? We'll stay there like five years max and then we'll come back. And here I am still in America. <laughs> um, my, <laughs> my parents didn't ever end up uh, uh, going back. Um, and it's, I mean, I know this isn't really necessarily like in a linear way talking about my journey, but um, it is pretty obvious if you if anyone's been paying attention to the news in Lebanon, why we didn't end up going back. Mm-hmm. Um it is such a beautiful, beautiful country and like so much a part of my heart and, and who I am. And um, it is currently suffering from a really extreme human rights conflict. Um, there's, you know, pretty incredible inflation where people um, are making now the lowest minimum wage in the world in Lebanon. It mm-hmm. costs about a month's salary for a bag of lemons um, oh. for people on minimum wage. So we're, we're really seeing like the demise of one of, I think the most beautiful, uh, nations in the world. Um, but that is why I'm still here essentially. And there's actually more Lebanese people living outside of Lebanon than there are in Lebanon, uh, which mm. is kind of an interesting, uh, thing. We've got like lots of, lots of roots in diaspora at this point. Um, so when I moved to, uh, the United States, I, I moved to a little town, a very small town. I feel like I was just about to break out into like the beauty and the beast, like a <laughs> little town, <Yeah. laughs> it's a quiet village. Um, but, uh, we, so I, uh, moved to Kent, Ohio, um, a place that is really only known by Kent state university, but is also very close to Akron, which if you're a basketball fan, is where LeBron James is from. Mm. (laughs) Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, And we lived there for about uh, six years. And um, my family then ended up moving to Rochester, Minnesota, which um, if folks are familiar with the shape of Minnesota, it's in the southeast corner, which means it's in the toe of the boot, as I like to say. Um, Minnesota is a really interesting state and Rochester in particular is fascinating. It's a really interesting place to grow up. I moved there when I was about 10. And, um, the city is really odd because it, there's almost no middle class in Rochester. Um, it's because of the Mayo Clinic, which is the number one hospital in the world. There are a slew of like consultants who are extremely wealthy. And there's also a slew of, um, refugees. So we have one of the highest, 
uh, populations of Somalian and Hmong refugees in the nation. Um, and what that means is that um, it is actually, even though it's incredibly diverse, it's a very conservative town. So really bizarre place to grow mm-hmm. up and live. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, and I ended up going to the University of Minnesota to study theater and political science, which my parents were thrilled about. No, they weren't. They were not thrilled. Um, we were excited for They were you. not thrilled at all. Yeah, you really were. You really were. Um, I will say they've, they've come around, but at that time that was like, why would our oldest daughter who like can study anything or be a doctor or engineer or a lawyer decide to study theater and poli sci? But I've really always had this deep belief that storytelling is one of the most powerful engines for social change that we have. And, um, that, that belief came far before actually I was even in college. Um, I was really involved in theater and I love to write and I love to tell stories. Um, and I love to tell stories that sort of included my perspective, my personal experience and things that I wasn't seeing and necessarily in, in the books and materials and images that I was being, um, sort of fed and being able to consume. Um, and pro- and after uh, I went to the University of Minnesota, I ended up um, teaching for a few years and got my master's in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I got to teach um, English as a second language, which is really cool as someone who was a former ESL student. Um, that felt like a really exciting time in my life. Um, and I ended up moving to Chicago after that about 10 years ago, where I spent most of my nine to five working in education nonprofit land and most of my side hustle working on this storytelling piece, um, which I felt for a long time um, couldn't be or shouldn't be my full time gig. Um, and I yeah, that was I, I had to take a really big leap on myself and a really big bet on myself um, about a little over two years ago when I decided to sort of make my nine to five or my five to nine, my nine to five Mm -hmm. and sort of say like, I'm putting it all into storytelling. And I really believe in this and believe that this is something that can genuinely change the way that society functions. Because when you change people's individual beliefs and do personal transformation, you change societal beliefs and societal transformation. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's essentially, that's a quick and dirty. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's pretty basic, right? It's just your basic immigrant tale. Not at all. I don't think that no. was basic <laughs> at all, but it was incredibly <laughs> fascinating. And I think there's about 800 questions that we have throughout that journey. Yeah, amazing. I've anything. got like yeah. three written down already from just the quick and dirty rundown. Um, I love it. But the first one, I guess, kind of like taking it back a little to when you had first moved to the to the U.S. and had settled in Rochester. Um, shortly after that, when you were about 12 is when 9-11 happened. And I know that not because I'm a creepy stalker, but because Asif is a <laughs> creepy stalker who found an article that was written about your family um, in their experience post post 9-11. And so knowing that now a lot of the work that you do, particularly with Pillars Fund, is around that representation of Muslims in the media, I might you might not have had enough time prior to 9-11, but did you see a big shift as a kid in like the way that you were aware of Muslim representations of media pre and post? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. Um, also my apologies to Asif, that photo of me is rough. Like I'm like, (laughs) I'm like in, I'm just this tiny 11 year old in like the ugliest glasses you've ever seen. And like a boot cut jean. (laughs) <laughs> what was I doing in a boot cut jean? Anyway, strutting your stuff. Apologies, out there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, whether we like it or not, for most of us that are sort of in that millennial generation, 9 11 had a really tremendous impact on who I was and how I saw myself. And I'm not necessarily proud of all the feelings that came up, you know, mm-hmm. especially as a young person. And I think that's important to share too that, like, there were feelings of shame as well and and fear as well. And not always this sort of courageous, uh, you know, let's fight the man attitude. Exactly. That, that I, you know, I think I've come to nurture. Hmm. Um, So pretty, pretty like shortly before 9-11 happened, um, maybe like a year or two before uh, my mom actually decided to start wearing the hijab this was something that um, even in Lebanon wasn't super common. Um, it, it wasn't super common in my family. I think in Lebanon, because of 
colonialism, French colonialism and aspirational whiteness. Um, I think people really associate like uh, religiosity with um, sort of poverty, frankly, mm. um, because because there is just I, I have to say there's this aspirational whiteness and aspirational, I think, Frenchness that has sort of been socialized into people there. And so this was like a big deal when my mom started wearing the hijab. And, um, she, it was something that she really wanted to do. It was just something that, um, she felt was important to her. She felt, um, at the time, I think she would tell you that things have evolved in the, in her whys. but at the time she said, you know, like, I love walking into a room and people judging me by my mind and not, you know, what I'm wearing. And that was sort of what she shared with me at a young age. Um, but my mom also picked me up from school every single day. And I do remember the literal day that 9-11 happened. I was in family and consumer sciences, um, which for folks that may not have this at their schools, it's like where you learn how to like cook an egg and like sew a gym bag. Mm. I don't. Those are great class. life skills um, that I wish we still got taught, but that's fine. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right. If you are exactly offering right. tutoring, I would take you up on it right now. <laughs> Okay, I have to tell you, I, you cannot le- ever let my mom hear this episode because my first B I ever got was on that gym bag. I got a B on the gym bag. <laughs> oh, she, no. Oh, my God. Did, did she I never let up, you forget I it? I tore up what? the... No, 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 she, she doesn't, doesn't know. She doesn't know. She doesn't know. Like she, yeah, yeah. No, I took I took the little like report that I got and I ripped it up into tiny little pieces and then I and then Ate I mixed it. up the pieces. I mixed up the pieces and I threw them in four different trash cans and uh, around the school. Wow. That were, like, in different oh, corners of the school. So there was no was, like, way it could be pieced together. I was like, no one's ever going to find out that I got to be on this gym. Yeah, talk, talk to about talk um, to us about your alternate career as a serial killer because clearly yeah, even exactly. you, since. You were very old. good at covering up. Yeah, things, yeah. Yes. Oh my God. Right on. Um, no, I'd be happy to chat about that offline for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> uh, no, but uh, you know, I was sitting in that class, and I remember them rolling out the big TV that you know used to be mm. in. Maybe they still are in classrooms, and um, hearing hearing pretty immediately a lot of assumptions being made on the TV screen. And having to at once reckon with the fact that I was afraid, just like everybody else, I had no idea what was going on, but watching a plane crash into a building is just objectively scary. Mm -hmm. And two, that everyone was looking at me. Mm. It was, it was hard to, to sort of understand that like I was afraid, but I was also being feared at the same time of the same thing I was afraid of. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think for a while when my, I, when my mom came to pick me up from school, like it was not pleasant for me. Um, there were a lot of questions that did not come. Pl- I love questions, but they did not come from a place of curiosity, but came from a place of judgment. Yeah. And there were questions that I, I now understood. And this was a really big shift in my life where the questions now were prove to me that you're not this instead of questions of tell me what you are. Mm -hmm. And I think for a long time, um, I would say like from middle school, which is, you know, when it happened um, until uh, gosh, I would say probably junior year of high school, I was very much in this mindset of let's play defense and let's do it aggressively. Mm -hmm. And um, it was very much like a, at pillars, we like to say like, it was a, it was a let us in attitude of like, just let me in. Like, hmm. I'm, I'm not those things. I'm not those things. I'm not those things. And it really took me a long time until I got to a place where I like was able to deeply understand my own identity, what I brought to the table, the, um, you know, ability to, to situate myself sociopolitically in a long legacy of marginalized peoples that have done incredible work before, you know, my family ever came to this country to understand, like, it's not about that. It's about having a check us out attitude. And I'm no longer at this point responding to people who are, are asking me to knock on their door so I can be let in, but I'm much more interested. And I think pillars is much more interested. And it's why I'm so proud to work there in hosting a party so good Mm -hmm. and so loud and so dope that people walk by and they knock on the door and they're like, can I check you out? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and that sort of ability to, to create and just be and exist radically and unapologetically without, um, kind of answering to the bounds of things like Islamophobia and sexism and racism and tribalism mm-hmm. and all those things. I think that's, that's like really where I see like the beginning of like liberating ourselves. Mm. Mm-hmm. No. And I think that, that that resonates very strongly with a lot of the intention and the work that we've done over the last, you know, decade plus with the Moscars and it exactly aligns with, I think, you know, the solution, if you will, as to, as to how we move the conversation forward from, from what, like you said, from that position of defense that we've all kind of been playing, playing in since nine 11, or even, even before that, to be honest, but just going back to that point, you know, um, we were all, I, I think, you know, like you, like you mentioned this kind of this millennial, uh, group of Muslims, like you, myself, Sophia, all of us kind of fall into that. We're all kind of in middle school, um, around nine 11. Yes, we were young, but it was such a profound, profound and, uh, impactful event in, in the moment as well. Did, and, and you also, you know, and your family, in addition to being, uh, Muslims were also recent immigrants to the country. It w- did, did you find that in any way your perspective of America or what it meant to be an American shifted as well in that moment? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, it, it came at a time where my I mean, I, I will say of all of us, my mom bore the brunt the most. Right. And I say that because she's the most visibly visibly Muslim, whatever yeah. that even means, yeah. right? It's like the that most visibly over, Muslim, over, yeah, mm-hmm. exactly, person in my family. And and frankly, like uh, I probably bore the least of it of my family because I'm very light skinned. I have a lot of light skin privilege. My brother and sister are darker, um, and so uh, like frankly, for me, it was this. I started to develop like a, a real like pit bull mentality around my mom, um, where even though my mom is brilliant and certainly does not need my protection as a little girl, like I really felt like, um, this is not a country that has built space for my mother to exist however she wants to. Mm-hmm. And I could really palpably feel that every time we went to a store and people followed us around, mm-hmm. every time I was stopped and heard her, you know, people asked a, you know, her, a, a judgmental question. Um, I, you know, have even experienced actually not too uh, long ago, I was with my mother and we, a, a, a pickup truck in rural Minnesota tried to run us off the road, mm. um, of, of young, young boys, um, tried to sort of like scare her off the road. And, um, it, it really did, uh, make me understand that this, um, I don't like calling it an experiment because it's a very intentional, um, structure, but this like American design was pretty intentionally trying to keep people like my mother from feeling safe here. Mm -hmm. And, um, the, and also this idea of like feeling like immigrants had to meet a certain threshold of success or perfection to be worthy of being in this country, Mm -hmm. um, which I totally do not ascribe to and, and who even defines what success is anyway, but it really did feel like there was this credentialing that had to happen in, in times where people would, you know, even my mom's friends who weren't Muslim would say things like, oh, but she's like a contributing member of society and she's on the mm. PTA and she's this, and she's, you know, um, a, a, an interpreter at the Mayo clinic and she's a professor and all of these things that she brought, which I appreciated, but I also felt like, well, the America I thought I lived in is one where none of that would have mattered anyway, mm-hmm. that yeah. she should still be safe regardless of that credential. That, yeah. Um, so yeah, so it certainly, certainly changed, uh, the way I saw America. And I think I started to see the matrix, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> w- w- was that, was that also a catalyst for you to then like, I mean, again, you're, you're, you're what, 11, 12 years old. So, I mean, it's, it's 11. It's un- yeah. It, yeah. It's unfair to like frame it from a perspective of like, you know, your entire career that followed, but w- was that, or, or maybe was, was your family very um, willing to be, outspoken in any way to say, Hey, listen, these things that are happening around us is not 
just, it's not fair, something needs to be said about it. Was that something that was more intrinsic within you that you kind of cultivated over time? Or, or was your family always that way that pushed you towards that? You know, I, I really do have to credit my parents here who are phenomenal and I love them very much. Um, I think a lot of people like, or a lot of people love their parents, but not everybody gets to like their parents. And I feel really blessed that I both get to like and love my parents. I think I'm really lucky. Um, but I, I absolutely think that they, you know, played a tremendous role there. Um, you know, the first thing that my parents taught me about Islam is that, you know, they, they told me like the first thing God Allah created in the universe is the Mizan or the scale of justice. And they were like, and there's a reason that's the first thing that was created. And so I have always believed in and been raised in Islam that is firmly rooted in justice first before mm -hmm. anything. And, um, that was always a real part of my upbringing. Um, I also will say that, um, you know, I think that my parents do something that a lot of adults don't do, which is that they evolve. There are things mm -hmm. that my parents had opinions about when we first moved to the States that they have totally different opinions about now um, as, you know, operators of social justice and like their understanding of social justice. And I think they reserve the right to change their minds and grow. And I think that is something that is so important. And it's something that's really pushed me um, in my desire for like constant growth and, um, and learning in my adulthood. Mm -hmm. um, so I will say that certainly catalyzed me. But um, it was actually not necessarily just that that catalyzed me. I think it was there was this moment in high school, and I can tell you the exact moment, where I was sitting in an AP course, which for Canadians listening, I don't know if y'all have AP. We, we have Do you AP. have AP? We have okay. AP. Okay, cool. <laughs> We're special so you too. Get it. Yeah. 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 No. <laughs> no, no, I just didn't know if it was called something else. I didn't know if it was called something else. We have IB you know? and AP. Which I yeah. think I be okay, yeah. So you have yeah, IB. Yeah. We don't even have IB because we're not fancy. Um, yeah. Well, you know, but IB is legit. <laughs> yeah. so, so I was I was sitting in an AP course, and I went to a school that was majority people of color. It was right. majority, uh, you know, refugee and immigrant, and uh, and yet when I was sitting in my AP course, I remember looking around one day and. Um, you know, there were two people of color in my AP course, which is really odd, isn't it? For a school that's majority people of color. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was myself and my friend, Nick Ekagerium. Hope you're doing well, Nick, yeah. um, who, who was black. And I remember being deeply disturbed by that. And then I remember kind of walking through the school and actually, visibly seeing, and this is really disturbing, like visibly seeing each floor, like become darker. Like, mm -hmm. and I know that sounds really, really insidious because it is, but literally like all of the ESL courses with Somalian folks were in the basement. And I was like, there is something so distressing and disturbing about this. And I know for a fact that I am not smarter than those people. And I know for a fact that I'm not more capable than those people. Mm -hmm. But I also knew that like, frankly, my family had more, more social capital, more social capital and, and their ability to, you know, my dad was educated in English school in Lebanon. So he spoke English upon coming to this country. He's able to advocate for me in a different way to get me out of ESL classes sooner. Like all of those things, plus the fact that I have light skin privilege, like really like it was, it was a moment where not only did I feel the marginalization because I was a Muslim recent immigrant in the United States, but I could also see the way that I was benefiting from privilege in the United States and how unfair that was. And I didn't deserve it more than anybody else. And so I think it was, it was both of those things combined with like my parents, um, just real commitment to justice as a form of practicing faith that made me be like, well, this isn't, this isn't right. And it's not fair to me, but it's also not fair to the people that I'm benefiting from these like whack structures of privilege from and that aren't able to get the same access to things that I am. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would say, yeah, all of those things combined. Mm -hmm. Um, and so with your then theater degree and your shift into teaching, mm -hmm. was this a big, like the, the elimination of barriers kind of a big part of that? Because like, it seems like, you know, initially you're like stories, is the way to go and create that empathy and like create that connection. And then like what kind of made you shift into never mind, like molding young minds is, is where it's at. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, I don't ever think it was an either or, or never mind. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was an and like a yes. And, mm -hmm. and I'll be honest. I mean, I think a couple things played into it. One, it was the recession and I was looking for a job <laughs> and you know, that, that was part of it. And I think, you know, finding a job in the arts is not necessarily super easy. Um, and two, like I did really believe in the fact that like the yes. And piece of that is that children learn through stories too. Mm -hmm. And they're at a, they're at a time, you know, I taught elementary schoolers, which is at a time where like their minds are still evolving. They're still learning how to, you know, um, understand the world around them. And also like they're learning and unlearning certain biases that they are being socialized into. And I just really wanted to be a part of that. And so, you know, I taught in the Bible belt, I was the only Muslim person that many of my students ever met. Mm -hmm. And it made a difference when, unfortunately, on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, this makes me feel so old because we just got the to the 20th anniversary. But unfortunately, on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, when Charlotte Public Schools required every class to teach uh, a lesson on 9-11 that was extraordinarily problematic, mm -hmm. it mattered to me that they heard it from me and that I was able to change that lesson to do something pretty radical for 30 kids. Mm -hmm. um, and the surprise on, um, I remember one of my, ch one of my children, one of my students, <laughs> I called them my children, one of my many children, my brood, um, one of my students, um, you know, came to school one day and this was also a student of color and not Muslim. And he said to me that, um, his car had been broken into the day before. And I was like, Oh my gosh, that's so awful. I'm so sorry that happened. And he said, yeah, I'm sorry too. My mom said it was Muslims. Mm. And I oh, thought wow. how fascinating, like this is such a fascinating moment, but instead of like crawling away and being like, wow, that's really awful, which it is. There was this moment of like, I can do something here. Right. Like if, again, I really have this value. I've said it a few times that I really have a value of curiosity over judgment. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, why, why did she think that? And, you know, we talked through that a little bit and I said, did you see them? Um, did they tell you they were, et cetera. And of course, no, no, no. Um, and then I said, and this like blew his little mind into smithereens. <laughs> I was like, well, did you know Miss McCarty is Muslim? And he just like, like mouth agape, like you could hear it hit the floor. <laughs> and, it, and I know, I know he won't forget that moment that he was like, oh, oh, that's what a Muslim is. And, and that mattered to me. That mattered to me that I could, I could do that with children and, and give them like exposure to something different and not just in, not just to me, but like, I really believe in stories. I always say as both a window and a mirror. Mm -hmm. And those kids needed a mirror so they could see themselves. And they also needed a window so they could see beyond themselves. We all need that even as adults. And so that's a real privilege and, and a real, um, a real like piece of radical political power to do in a classroom. And mm -hmm. it was a really exciting one for a time in my life that I, I won't ever take for granted. Mm -hmm. And another yes and component of your career would be how you also pivoted or not pivoted, but also added um, advocacy work and education reform into your, into your catalog of, of, of uh, changing minds and, and, and building a better future. <laughs> you worked with an organization called One Goal, which um, looked to close the degree divide, right? Where all children have an ability to yes. pursue the highest level of education they can. You touched already on, you know, what I would assume is a, uh, a big example of that with your, uh, your high school experience. Um, and I'm assuming within your time teaching, you saw similar aspects of that where there were, you know, whether it was socioeconomic or racial divides between levels of uh, education or, or, or um, uh, barriers to education. W w was there something more systemic that you were hoping to um, accomplish with that? Or, or was it a combination, a culmination of these anecdotal experiences that you were having throughout your life that made you decide to go and go and work with one goal? Again, very yes. And, yeah. um, I, you know, really believe in like God opening opportunities for us. And I believe that like 
every opportunity that has opened for me that has, you know, has felt right, has been easy to take, even if it was scary. And I really believe in taking, when I'm scared of something that is usually a sign to me that I should do it. Mm -hmm. Cause I know that it's because I'm on my growing edge. I'm like at the top of that roller coaster, just ready to roll down. And that's like when we experience growth. Um, and so, yeah, my work with one goal, um, was a really incredible chapter of my life. They're still uh, doing that important work. And I would recommend anyone listening to this to look into it and support their work. Um, I had like the great honor of, um, sort of leading the year three program in our Chicago office, which, um, worked with over a thousand freshmen in college that were primarily first generation college students. Um, it certainly was something systemic. And so I think, you know, at one goal, which this is also true in my pillars work, which I'm sure we'll get to talk about. Um, I really believe in always having a grass tops and a grassroots strategy. So my grass top strategy is always about systemic reform. And my grassroots strategy is always about personal transformation for collective liberation. And at one goal, yes, like those over 1000 students that we worked with every year, that was really our grassroots opportunity to say, you know, we certainly believe in you. And if this, if this is what you truly want for yourself, we want you to be able to say nothing, held me back from this. Mm-hmm. Um, but that learning as we tried to, and unsuccessfully in, in most cases supported these students through their freshman year of college, which is when most students drop out. That's why we stopped the program after year one, uh, or year three, sorry. Um, we also could see the way the systemic issues were trickling down to these students in everyday uh, interactions. Like, for example, we had an emergency fund at one goal um, that we could support students in if they needed a little bit of cash in order to um, stay in school rather than drop out. And this is really um, shocking, I think, still to me, even though I saw it happen time and time again, usually the difference between a student staying in school and not staying in school is $500. Wow. Mm. $500 as an emergency fund or less can be the reason a student does not get the degree that they are excited about getting. And that's a systemic issue. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, That's an absolutely systemic issue. And what we also did at one goal is, you know, on my team, I also um, manage our post-secondary partnerships team, which did work with schools to sort of transform their environments and share our findings and, and ask them to um, sort of change some of their like regulations and systems so that our students would be able to thrive in those spaces. Because the last thing you want to do is get a student to the door of a college that isn't prepared to serve them, which in the vast majority of cases, especially at predominantly white institutions, mm-hmm. um, is, is what ends up happening mm-hmm. is, is kids are like against all odds getting their degree mm-hmm. instead of against all odds, not getting their degree. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's devastating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One question I had was in terms of, I just really like the idea and you've mentioned it earlier about like, as as kind of any marginalized group like your your offensive self versus defensive self if i can call it that um and how like yeah like instead of being like here are all the things that i'm not like please you know like and understand and support me even though you think all these things because like this is how i'm different versus being like this is who i am um and i think obviously when you are able to live a more authentic life when you don't have so many barriers and when your needs are met in so many different ways, I think it's easier to live um, and be that authentic and offensive self. But like, do you have any kind of recommendations for people who are wanting to do that more in their life or through their art? Like how, how can you have that loud, awesome, dope party where people want to come instead of trying to get into their party? It's such a good question. Um, and I think that's, that's so much of the work that we, you know, do at Pillars is thinking about not just the external factors of what are, what is holding Muslim communities back from sharing their stories, but like, what is the internalized oppression where we're like playing ourselves a little bit. Right. And, Mm -hmm. and I'm not saying that in a judgmental way. Again, this is, I'm someone who certainly experiences and has experienced internalized oppression in a number of ways. Um, but I'm saying that in the sense that like, we, need to focus more on the fact that um, we have also been socialized into these beliefs and that is intentional 
as well, intentional and systemic as well. And what I would say um, as a recommendation, you know, it, it's it's interesting the the number of Muslim storytellers, and again, I'm not saying this in judgmental way, but the number of Muslim storytellers that have a story in their portfolio that is centered around things like national security. Um, when I want us to really think about um, how do we uh, how do we define a Muslim issue? We often jump to um, if I'm going to talk about diaspora, if I'm going to talk about Muslim identity, I'm going to talk about the Muslim issue, which is terror and national security. But what what actually are like the other Muslim issues that we need to help ourselves define and mm-hmm. everyone else redefine mm-hmm. um, that go beyond that? Things like um, prison reform, which is absolutely in our Quranic DNA. Mm-hmm. We have multiple stories about like false imprisonment in the Quran. We have multiple stories about uh, multiple hadith about the importance of, of freeing prisoners in the Quran. That's a Muslim issue. Mm-hmm. How do we think about, um, you know, redistributing wealth? That's a Muslim issue. One of our five pillars is zakat. That is a tax. That's a wealth tax that would literally, if everybody in the world took that on, would resolve the hunger crisis. Mm-hmm. Like these are the things that we, there are so many other things that are Muslim issues beyond us playing defense. And so I like us to think like um, one of my dear friends and a board member on uh, the Pillars uh, board, um, Rashid uh, Shabazz. He is the executive director at an organization called Critical Minded that seeks to uplift critics of color. And he was previously the chief storytelling officer at Color of Change. But a question he often asks, and I love this question, is um, what doesn't happen in America without Muslims? Mm. Like what good does not happen in America without Muslims? Mm -hmm. And here in the United States, on top of those Muslim issues, we are also the most racially and ethnically diverse faith group in the world. That means that we have the opportunity to model what it means to be a beloved pluralistic community. And what would that mean if America could look to us and say like, wow, the Muslims really are a model of true pluralism in a way that's deeply inspiring and shows us what's possible um, across lines of difference. And so what I would say is like, really ask yourself, like, how can I expand what I think about as a quote unquote Muslim issue? And how can I, how can I answer the question from my point of view in my sector of the community of like, what doesn't happen in America without me? And I think that that will help uncover and liberate some of the stories inside you that are like teaming it out and are going to tell a really fresh, exciting story that can genuinely like change somebody's life Mm -hmm. as both a window and a mirror. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I think that's fantastic. And I think definitely a, a, a really fascinating question to think about. Like, yeah, like what would what would happen if if me as an artist wasn't here? Like what? Yeah, that's cool. Um, and to I think then potentially this might be a good segue into talking about the Pillars Fund because uh, we haven't hit that yet. Um, is that <laughs> I've been kind of thinking recently a lot about like flawed characters and like what a privilege it is to have a character from your group that can be flawed without it reflecting negatively on like the whole community. Cause I was, I was chatting with this uh, about this with a friend because um, two shows that I love and have watched recently, one is Shrill who are the main character is A.D. Bryant as a fat woman. And then with never have I ever where the main character is um, go God, what's her name? Davy um, who is a, a, like a Brown girl. And I remember just being like, I love these shows so much. Like I love the representation and I find them very well written and entertaining and everything. But I was also like thinking about like if I liked the characters as people and I was like, I don't think I do. Like, I don't know that there's, you know, certain things, decisions that they made or ways that their trauma kind of affected the way that they treated other people where I'm like, oh, I don't love that. But I really appreciated that they could, they had the freedom to be flawed. And I think that's like the next step in representation is like being able to have a character that does not treat the community like a monolith and does not have to represent everyone. Um, And so to that end, I think like in in your work with Pillars Fund in terms of researching the ways that Muslims are represented in media and everything, uh, what are your thoughts on like on on those flawed characters? And like, do you think that we're we're there yet where like we can have main characters who are Muslim and who are also like bad people 
or or you know complex people as we all are or do we need maybe a little more groundwork before we can do that I love this question this is such a good question um is it okay if I start with just sharing with folks a little bit about what our research found about yes. Muslims yeah, or in popular even, even media? If, even if we take a step back before that, if you could give <laughs> our listeners maybe even a quick 30 seconds of who the Pillars Fund is or what the Pillars Fund yeah. is, that could be helpful mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, Yes. absolutely. So Pillars Fund is an organization that seeks to uplift the leadership, narratives, and talents of Muslims in the United States. And we do that through a couple ways. The first way and and the way that we've done this longest is through our Catalyze Fund, which is run by my incredible colleague, uh, Vice President of Programs, Kalia Abiyade. Um, Our Catalyze Fund really seeks to invest in um, the Muslim-led organizations in the United States that are kind of building the infrastructure that is a step after what our parents' generation did, which was so lovely of like building this religious infrastructure. But now it's about building civic infrastructure. So we invest in three main categories. The first is reimagining public safety. The second is mental health and wellness. And the third is building civic power. So we, we do that work and we support social entrepreneurs in that wing. And about two years ago, Pillars brought me on because they realized that just doing that support didn't necessarily feel sufficient in changing the game for Muslims in the United States because our social entrepreneurs kept butting up against the same thing again and again and again, which was that, again, um, they had to play defense with all these things like Trump pulling out the Muslim ban or, you know, um, uh, these anti-Sharia bills, et cetera, that we see all across the country. So folks are playing defense and in rapid response mode. What we realized was what would be ultimately most helpful to those organizations is to start another wing of pillars called the culture change arm. And what our culture change work seeks to do is actually change the water that we're swimming in, the current that we're swimming in, so that it's the dominant messaging isn't one that we have to play defense with, but is one that we can uh, ultimately end up swimming with rather than against. So the idea is reclaiming the dominant narrative and really ensuring that we have these full, dignified, authentic, and nuanced representations of Muslims. And that does not necessarily mean positive portrayals or propaganda type portrayals of, or, you know, after school special <laughs> style portrayals. But what I love about the examples that you shared, Sophia, is those two characters that you named, which is like A.D. Bryant's character on Shrill and Davey on um, Never Have I Ever. They're not likable characters, but they are dignified and full portrayals. Mm. And by that, I mean that you understand so much about why they are the way they are. Mm -hmm. They have a deep backstory. They, um, you know, have successes and failures. They have good days and bad days. They have moments of, of elation and moments where they like could not have made a worse choice. They have family members that they interact with and they have friends and they have love and they have all of these different like facets of the human experience. Mm -hmm. Now that I want us to all hold that in our minds that like that, those are really dignified portrayals despite being unlikable, because I do want to share that pillars did some really um, exciting research alongside USC Annenberg's inclusion initiative. Um, Ford foundation also supported this. And we worked with Riz Ahmed's uh, left-handed films. It's his production company to explore the reality of Muslims in popular global movies. We looked at Um, 200 top grossing movies released between 2017 and 2019 in the United States, the UK, New Zealand, and Australia. I'm just going to give you a a quick snapshot of some of the things we found. In these top 200 films, only 144 out of nearly 9,000 speaking roles were Muslim characters. That means 98.4% of people that we're seeing on screen are not Muslim. Um, even though about a quarter of the world's population is Muslim. Mm -hmm. Primary and secondary Muslim characters are often limited to being depicted as perpetrators of or victims of violence. Over half, 53.7% of these characters were targets of violence and 39% were perpetrators of violence. What does that do to a community and, and the people who don't belong to it 
when you are constantly seeing yourself or this group through a lens of violence. Mm -hmm. We saw, you know, more than 90% of the film studied had no Muslim characters whatsoever, like not even non-speaking characters. Only six of these films featured a Muslim and a solo duo or ensemble lead role, all men. Um, Only one Muslim man was depicted as LGBTQ, one cisgender Muslim man. Only one cisgender Muslim man was depicted as having a disability, even though we know that about one in four people live with a disability. And none of the 23 animated films we looked at had a Muslim character. So kids are essentially getting no exposure. Mm. Also, It gets even worse, again, like you saw with the intersectionality of LGBTQ or disability, et cetera. Um, It gets even worse when you think about other overlapping intersectional identities. So when you look at women, we were outnumbered 175 to 1 by our male counterparts on screen. Only 23.6% of all Muslim characters were women. Um, 51% were in films set in the past which just totally excludes Muslims from modern life, really don't exist anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And almost 90% of these characters spoke no English or spoke with an accent that rendered them foreign. Mm -hmm. Um, Even though we know, as uh, one of my colleagues, Hussein Rashid, likes to say, uh, there has never been an America without Muslims because a third of Muslims that were brought over um, as uh, enslaved people during the times of chattel slavery were we're Muslim. Mm -hmm. Um, and we also found that racially we're really being treated as monoliths. So even though we know that about 60% of the world's Muslims are from Asia and about a third of U S Muslims are black. Um, we see about 66.7% of Muslim characters being depicted as middle Eastern. So we're fighting against a lot of these, these tropes, which I think show you Sophia that like, we're not getting those nuanced, dignified portrayals Mm. at all right now. Mm -hmm. So it's not even a matter of like, are we ready for positive representation or negative representation? We're not even really getting like true representation in any way, shape or form, because we're only seeing essentially one type of Muslim who is a straight foreign man who is probably Middle Eastern and doesn't speak English. Mm -hmm. That is a very, very like monolithic view of who Muslims in North America are, um, who Muslims in the UK and Australia are. And so that's the first thing is like helping folks understand like how rich our community is, because a lot of Muslims aren't seeing themselves at all positive or negative. They're just missing. Right. And then the other Muslims are maligned, like like you shared, you know, we've had, we, you, you were asking about these like flawed characters And I love this question about flawed characters because we absolutely do deserve flawed characters because otherwise we're not getting real art, real like art that we can like debate and engage with Mm -hmm. and that reflects the reality of our lived experience. Um, And on top of that, the issue is if we don't get more and much more Muslim representation, it's going to continue to feel like a scarcity mindset for Muslim communities that if we're going to have anybody on screen they better damn well be perfect and do everything for everyone. Mm -hmm. And that's just not realistic. And so I think the solution here is like, yes, we're absolutely ready for flawed characters on TV and that are Muslim. But in order to do that, we need so many more shows that do so many more things for so many more people. Mm -hmm. We need that abundance and we have the abundance. And so we need that abundance. I want to know, you know, the young um, black hijabi Muslim woman's story. I want to know the Latinx Muslim who, you know, they're the, the large, the fastest growing convert community in the U S I want to know that story. I, I want to know all of these stories that we just aren't seeing at all right now. And once we do, I think it's really going to open us up to saying like, okay, well this one Muslim character doesn't have to like Define be the spokesperson us, yeah. for all Muslims. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So if we get more content out there, I think that's, that's really going to give us an opportunity to get into those like juicier roles. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I liked the best about this entire research uh, that that you guys did in, in collaboration with these other organizations is the fact that you also provided some level of a solution through the blueprint um, and not just here's the problem. Right. And so can you can you touch a little bit on the different stakeholders that you guys identified as necessary to help make um, the next step uh, towards solving this very real issue that we're facing right now? 
Yeah. So like you said, we wanted to be sure that when we got this data out and proved to folks that we were, or what we were all qualitatively feeling as a community, like they couldn't gaslight us anymore. Like it's really happening. Yeah. Um, the blueprint for Muslim inclusion is really comprised of community developed solutions for film and television industry professionals to learn and implement practices that are designed to support Muslim stories and storytellers. So this is our grass top strategy. This is the thing that allows us to say, we will hold you accountable to make your organization a transformed place where once we get a Muslim to your door, they can thrive and succeed. Mm. And so our blueprint for Muslim inclusion, kind of like you said, it takes into account that all industry leaders have the opportunity to uplift Muslim narratives by really recognizing uh, Muslims as a marginalized, erased, and under-resourced group in DEI programming. So our blueprint offers long, short, and medium-term solutions for, for many groups. Um, they include studios, networks, production companies, film and drama schools, festivals, agencies, philanthropists, unions. Um, and we're really, we have a specific blueprint for each of these groups. And this is free to view online on our website. If anyone's curious, it's, it's accessible to anyone. Mm -hmm. This is a resource that we really are incredibly excited about the response we've gotten to it uh, because there are many organizations, which I can't talk about yet, but we'll be able to talk about in a couple months that have said like, yeah, we want to officially be a blueprint partner and say like, we are taking on the blueprint for Muslim inclusion. We are ready to transform at the macro level to make sure that once we, we get Muslims into our door, that we are able to uplift and maintain their integrity in this process and in this industry that was not built to hold their integrity. Mm. So we're really excited about that. Um, a couple examples I can share are, you know, with agencies, we talked about conducting script reviews that capitalize on the expertise of self-identified Muslims before shopping scripts to ensure that Muslim representation in their scripts is inclusive and accurate and nuanced. Um, auditing the talent pool and tracking the number and percentage of intersectional Muslim writers, above the line talent and on screen talent they represent. Intentionally seeking out polycultural and uh, intersectional and diverse Muslim talent. So it's not just straight Muslim men, um, et cetera. We talked about with studios and networks and production companies examining and reforming casting practices, sourcing Muslim vendors and suppliers. So not one more of my girls has to say, why did that person tie my hijab so weird? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so we've got we've got places where uh, we have a full list um, where, you know, we can support sourcing in the blueprint as well of places where they can find Muslim talent. Yeah. So we've got lots and lots and lots of solutions in there that I would love for people to, to check out. I, I, I'm wondering, you know, because so much of what you guys have outlined is how we can do better at being more inclusive, right? But at the end of the day, um, it, it, it's an industry that is obviously there to make money, right? It's a business. Um, mm -hmm. Hollywood is a business. Have you guys done any research or ha has there been any um, work that outlines the business case in the sense that there is a very real market out there that is looking for more diverse stories, um, you know, utilizing Rami or Hassan or and, and anyone else who has maybe made some level of commercial mainstream success to paint the picture of there is more to this than just do it for the sake of it's the right thing to do. Absolutely. Um, so we don't we haven't done uh, specific research on this, but we absolutely have talked a lot about the market, the fact that about a quarter of the world is Muslim and most of our media comes from the United States mm -hmm. worldwide. Um, I think it is uh, incredibly exciting that I, I, we're probably going to talk about the fellowship. Yes. Yeah. 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 We'll touch on the next. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so. So we absolutely have, you know, many folks in our circle who uh, are in partnership with Pillars, which I know we'll talk about in a bit, um, that are some of these incredible success stories, whether it's Mahershala Ali or Riz Ahmed or Rami Youssef or Lena Khan or Nida Mansour or Hassan Minhaj or Jahan Nujem. We have so many people that are proof points at this point. And I really believe like it is so exciting to see the way that really large, major streamers, production companies, studios, et cetera, are responding us and saying, it's responding to us and saying like, wow, this really is an, an untapped market of incredible potential and are really committed to 
being able to uplift um, the stories that our community believes are great stories to tell. Mm -hmm. So, so on that point, um, the fellowship that, that you just mentioned, um, you guys are also putting your money where your mouth is and, and putting together the, this fellowship, um, with it, well, first of all, maybe if you can just quickly describe what it is. And then as a follow up question to that, I know that the applications just closed. Were you in any way surprised by either the quality or the quantity of applicants that you guys received? Yeah. So the fellowship is our grassroots solution to this issue of us, like you said, putting our money where our mouth is and saying, um, not only do we want to transform Hollywood and hold your feet to the fire, but we also want to prove to you that this talent is so unbelievably abundant. It exists, it has always existed. We're not creating new talent. We're just giving you an opportunity and the privilege to get to see the talent. Again, that check us out, not let us in. And um, what our fellowship does is a couple things. First, it gives uh, fellows $25,000 in unrestricted grant money to use however they see fit. This was really important to us for a number of reasons. The first is that in the United States, the, the most likely faith community to live in poverty is Muslims. And in the UK, um, over 50% of Muslims live in poverty, mm -hmm. meaning that there are so many stories out there that um, we don't want to lose because people don't have the privilege of choosing storytelling as their vocation. That is something that we know $25,000 can't completely fix, but we want to lower the waterline as much as possible. So if this is someone who says, I'm really talented and I'm ready to show the world my writing, but I need to quit my second job and I just want to use this money to pay my rent, that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. If there's someone who says, I want to use this 25 k to make the short film of my dreams so that it can be my calling card, that's also okay. We really trust artists. This is a model that trusts artists. And the second piece is that I like to say we have like a triangle of support, like a tripartite support system. The top of the triangle, it's... It's a, you know, equal on all sides. What's that called? An equilateral. An equilateral. Triangle. Equilateral. <laughs> yeah. There you go. We I was, like, was going to say equilateral. <laughs> yeah. I know. I was going to say equilateral, and then I got nervous. I was like, what if I <laughs> No, you like, had um, it. You had it. <laughs> <laughs> it's an equilateral triangle. Uh, if you look at the top of the triangle, um, that's really what, what I like to refer to as their industry mentor. And their industry mentor is someone who is sourced from our incredible – incredible board of advisors who I just named a few of them, but I'd be happy to name again, who are people who are like the absolute trailblazers of uh, Muslims in Hollywood, people who have made really wise decisions over a long course of their own personal history to say no to the right things and yes to the right things so they can maintain their integrity and have the careers that they ultimately want and desire in Hollywood and have also made some really tremendous and unbelievable shifts in culture through their storytelling. Those are folks like Golden Globe nominated and Emmy, no Golden Globe winning and Emmy nominated Rami Youssef, um, Oscar nominated and Emmy winning Riz Ahmed, Oscar winning Mahershala Ali, um, Lena Khan, who's the first hijabi woman to ever direct a feature for Disney, um, Sana Amanat, who created Miss Marvel. Uh, Jahan Nujaim and Kareem Ahmed, who are a really incredible documentary duo that have just were also Oscar nominated have made like incredible documentaries. Um, Hassan Minhaj of Patriot Act and The Daily Show. And the list goes on. We've got the greatest group of folks who are there to provide really candid one-on-one -on -one, uh, championship and mentorship to our fellows. The second tip of the triangle is sort of their uh, business mentor. So this is someone that we're sourcing from the industry that is a development exec uh, that is going to be matched with each of our fellows who can really tell them like, okay, I might not be Muslim, but I know development and I care about you. So when you get called into that pitch meeting, that all important pitch meeting, I'm going to tell you like what I, what I would ask as a development exec. So you can be ultimately incredibly ready to dazzle and not, you know, throw that shot away. So we have someone who can be that business side and, and, you know, ensure that those things that Sekundar, you talked about around um, making sure that the dollars are there, et cetera, is sustainable. And the last piece is that we are working with them um, through a group of incredible academics that have been part of another fellowship I run, the Muslim Narrative Change Fellowship, um, which is a group of culture change experts, historians, academics, et cetera, 
who are able to actually work with them and say, like, let's actually work through positioning you sociopolitically and historically in what Muslim media has been up until now. So you know your ancestry, you know where you came from, and now you know how to change the rules in a way that is outside of the bounds of your internalized oppression. Mm. So those are like really the the three Try, the three points of support that we're trying to offer in this holistic model. Hmm. It's it's so it's so interesting and, and like relevant to our conversation that we had very recently with uh, Aksa Altaf, who's a very uh, talented uh, director, and she was talking about how one of the things that she's trying to spend time working on is bridging this this uh, socioeconomic d- barrier that exists uh, in the arts and how. You know, a twenty-five thousand dollar unobstructed fellowship is absolutely monumental for people who otherwise just would not literally be able to afford making art. And mm-hmm. recognizing how, as you mentioned, such a large contingent of the Muslim community unfortunately falls within um, th- that category. So, so just being able to access the funds and the resources is in itself such a huge step towards uh, sharing stories that otherwise would not be heard. And, and creating levels of understanding, right? And I think, too, that it feels like you would, like, it's such a, I think it's a real nice way to honor the stories that you would not hear otherwise. Like, in our conversation with Aksel Thaf, like, that was brought up as well, that, like, these stories just get lost then. Like, they they never have an opportunity to be told on on the scale or shared with that many people. And so I think it's a really nice way to honor, like, the the full Muslim experience includes, yeah, such a large population as well. But yeah, not not the stories you usually hear. Yeah, I mean, that's the hope. And I think, you know, given the fact that we got so many applications, so many more than I was expecting, we've received over 650 applications for this fellowship, mm-hmm. which really shows that like, there is no lack of talent, aspiration, interest, passion, desire um, in these communities. And it is just so exciting to see that 650 people were like, I'm ready to throw my hat in the ring because I have something to say. Mm-hmm. Mm. And that really has been so deeply inspiring. Yeah, no, that's incredible. That's awesome. I wish we could give them all 650. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe one day, you know, maybe it's just a matter inshallah. of time. Before we're inshallah. Going, inshallah, inshallah. That, that actually brings me to this idea of uh, abundance versus scarcity within sort of the artistic world, right? And the idea that the few Muslim creators who have had some recent success have taken up all the space in the room, which, you know, obviously for, for us in this room is is flawed thinking. But, uh, you know, I want to get your thoughts on that idea and, and also get your thoughts on how we can, how, how better we can shift perspectives within sort of um, whether it, it if that idea exists within industry, how we can shift perspectives of gatekeepers within that? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I actually don't even know that I would say that um, that's a struggle in the industry because I find that the industry has the opposite problem, which is that they're extremely risk averse Mm -hmm. and they really love comps for those that don't know Mm -hmm. and are listening casually, like comps or comparables or shows that are like your show that you're trying to produce or a film that's like the film that you're trying to produce so that you can have a proof point that it'll sell. And so while it may seem like in the, in the mindset that um, you're talking about of scarcity, while it may seem like having Arami already out there, means that no one else wants an Arami. It's actually the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. Now everyone wants Mm Arami. Um, so I think, I think that's the first piece. The second piece is that I do really have to commend like many of the advisors that we have on our team. I think like part of the reason that many of them would say they join this is because they want to intentionally take part in saying, okay, I made it, but that's not enough. I don't, as Riz loves to say, he's like, but I don't want to be the exception to the rule. That's Mm -hmm. not good enough exceptions don't change the rules. I'm trying to change the rules. And what I love about this group of people is they've all said like, all right, I maybe made it here, but like now I'm extending a hand to take someone else up with me. Mm. And I really believe that with like the power in that space, because there's a lot of power on that advisory board and a lot of people eager to champion new talent that we're actually in a better position now than before there was anything out there and people quote unquote taking up space 
because Hollywood doesn't like risks. Hmm. And so now we have, we've had a proof point. We have several proof points that show like something like we are lady parts on Peacock can Mm -hmm. be a huge success. That show is so good. Um, It is. Yeah. So I guess like to kind of um, start to wrap up just because we are nearing our time, but it's going to be juicy, I know. So to start that train, um, I have like a two-parter question about like your specific art experience as an individual. Um, And so the first one is that I had read an article that you had written for Teen Vogue a few years ago now about an experience that you and your mom had um, at a store in the US J Crew that was like a really xenophobic, awful time. Um, And you like write so beautifully, like everyone should read this article and everyone should also read your LinkedIn because like (laughs) that was even poetry. Like I was reading that and I was like, these are usually so cheesy, but this one is like so lovely. Um, That's so kind. So (laughs) so good. Um, But one of the things that you mentioned in that Um, that kind of really stuck with me was like you say like don't betray yourself to make them comfortable and I think that when you talk about like a lot of Muslim artists having for example that national security focused story in their repertoire like I think a lot of it is like kind of changing your own shape to fit into this what you think will get you where you want to go Um, And I think that, you know, and we do that in so many different ways, whether it's, you know, to different extents, whether it's changing the way that we dress or, you know, changing your name, shortening it or just a different pronunciation so that, you know, a white person's tongue can say it easier. And I think that like with all of that, like how, how, like is, I guess, is there space and how do you think people can do that better to like not betray yourself and your story and like the authenticity of that to make other people comfortable when the industry is still so heavily skewed towards the comfort of a certain type of person. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the short answer is, I don't know, but I, <laughs> the long answer is, <laughs> is like, I have a hypothesis. Yeah. <laughs> um, it is such a big question because I think for for many people that belong to marginalized groups, your very existence makes people uncomfortable mm-hmm. and your very existence is is radical and your joy is radical. And I don't want to diminish that, that every day that you get up and you decide to like live your day fully like you have accomplished something. And I really feel proud of all of us that do that. Um, Mm -hmm. And all of us that sometimes can't because it's really difficult. And I send love to those folks too. Um, But I guess my question is, before we decide what other people want and what makes them comfortable, I think it's really important to know thyself. And I really do believe, as corny as this might be, like, it is so important to like genuinely sit down for a couple days and think about as a storyteller, like what is my purpose statement? What is my vision statement as an artist? Right. Because if you don't have that to come back to, you're not going to ask yourself, well, what makes me comfortable? There's nothing to come back to and Mm. say what excites me and what makes me comfortable And so that makes it really easy to like people please or try to make somebody else or the big bad or whatever, (laughs) the powers that be, the dominant culture comfortable. Mm -hmm. So I really like would encourage people. I know that's something that really helps me is I I encourage people to sit down and think about like, what are your core values as a person and as a creator? Mm -hmm. Like I know one of mine is curiosity, right? And like, does this actually lean into curiosity Or is this somebody else's value that I'm leaning into to try to fit a square peg into a round hole? Mm. Um, Another one of mine is joy. Is this something that leans into joy? Or is this something that um, leans into something that somebody else cares about? Is this something that leads into justice? Or is this something that um, sort of makes the status quo seem like it is what it is and there's no changing it? Mm. Um, I know for me, like going back to it and remembering it doesn't have to be this way and having it written down, like the way I'd like it to be helps me protect myself from shape shifting Mm -hmm. for the sake of someone else. 
and for the sake of a success that may never actually satisfy me because it's not really mine. Mm. Damn. And like, is that a part of any type of like mentorship that exists? Because I think like, I think it's hard to do that on your own. And so I wonder like, is there, I'm assuming there's so much wisdom out there that could be shared on how, how to kind of create your own, yeah, your own like set of like artistic values, if you will, on like, you know, what, what do I want to make sure that I achieve and say and do? um, And what do I not want to compromise on? Yeah. I mean, one thing I'll say is that certainly it's, I can already reveal that it's definitely going to be part of our programming at Pillars. It's something that was really important to me to, and our whole team to include. Mm -hmm. Um, And I will also say there is a book called The Artist's Way that a lot of people may already be familiar with um, that has a lot of like great writing exercises in it that can be really helpful in sort of clarifying that for you. So if you're, Mm -hmm. if you're someone who enjoys journaling, wants a deep dive, et cetera, I'd really recommend The Artist's Way. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and then, yeah, my second question of the two-parter um, is, can you tell us about the girl deep down below? And Oh, my gosh. And where can I watch it? Because I've been trying to find I honestly it. I don't know. And it's nowhere. And I'm sad about it. I'm sorry. It may not exist online anymore. Oh, that's heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah, sorry. But yeah, it was, it was a really fun project. Um, a couple of my pals in Chicago, um, we... Um, were kind of brought together to uh, be part of this um, web series that was really led by and centered on Muslim women. Um, It was a sci-fi, which is really fun. I feel like we never really get to see like identity kind of come alive in in genre, if Mm -hmm. that makes sense. Um, And and I'm a big sci-fi geek. So this is like sci-fi horror. And um, it it was really cool. It was sort of focused on um, undocumented Muslim girls sort of disappearing in Chicago and how no one really cared. Mm. Um, and so these girls take it upon themselves to sort of try to understand like who is kidnapping these women and why. Um, and it's got a super natural bend to it and it's, (laughs) it's a lot of fun. Um, it was, it was a really fun project to do. And I'm, um, really glad that we got to sort of tell a story that was so unapologetically Muslim centered. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think of the whole cast, there was only one non-Muslim person, one white person. um, And everybody else uh, was a Muslim actor. And so that felt really exciting to just be a part of a space where we all got to kind of radically be ourselves. But I don't think it's available online. Sorry. Shucks. I used to be, but it was like years ago. I know. I was trying to look and I found the trailer um, well, Asif, sure. I lied. I'm taking credit yeah. for Asif's work. Asif found the trailer that I watched and then was like, where is the rest of it? And yeah, it's nowhere. I'm but sure you know. Asif is going to find like a VHS version of it somewhere in the, <laughs> Oh my God. Somewhere. I hope not. Someplace. DVDs, man. Amazing. It was it was more recent than that. It'd be it was like deep. Blu-ray. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you can find a copy, if you have an in and you want to, we'll, I'll let y'all know. We'll do a little screening here. Know. Moskers presents. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. But yes, I just I that that seemed like a really cool thing, and yeah, not something that like I, I don't know if you've um like Lovecraft County. And how, like, that's, like, such a cool, like, sci-fi thing that's, like, you're just, like, people of color are never in these stories. And, like, that's such a cool thing. So Lovecraft Country, actually, Jan Demange is one of our advisors, and he directed Lovecraft Country. So uh, we also have him on board um, for our Pillars Fund fellows, uh, which I'm really, really excited about. He's incredible. Nice. That's dope. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, with that, before we wrap, we like to do uh, a, a series of rapid fire questions. Are you down? Yes. Yes. Amazing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so these are questions that have no right or wrong answers. So don't don't freak out. It's the first thing that comes okay. to your mind. I don't have to like rip up my report card yeah. at the end. <laughs> Maybe we'll see. We'll see how how this goes. But first thing that comes to your mind, um, take it away, Sophia. Okay. Okay. So first one is, what is your most rewatched movie? 
the holiday. Oh my god, it's so good! I love the holiday. It's one of my favorite. It's it's so good. It's I'm so, so good. embarrassed, but it is. No, don't be embarrassed. I'm right there with you. It is so oh good. Oh my god. I was 100 percent expecting some like documentary <laughs> that's like super woke. The holiday, I love it. I love no, it. whenever, whenever so I'm sick, it's fine. like my comfort movie. Mm. It's it's not good, but it's what it's like a bowl it's of chicken soup. Chili. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's oh, chicken chili. soup. Yeah. Chili works. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's chili. It's so good. Okay. I was uh, like, I'm, I felt it coming. I felt it coming on. I could not pick me out of my mouth. I love it. I love it. Okay, number two. What is your most regrettable purchase? Uh, sorry, this isn't rapid. What is my most regrettable purchase? <laughs> no, it doesn't have to be rapid. <laughs> okay, okay. I felt that's why I blurted it out. Okay, what is my most regrettable purchase? I have so many regrettable purchases. Um, oh my god, there's this candy. <laughs> there's this candy called like matcha melts or something and they're they're like a a candy that's from abroad i don't know where but i picked it up because it looked interesting matcha like dark chocolate on the outside they were so rich and so gross <laughs> oh, also yesterday 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 actually this, this yesterday i bought a lemonade that had charcoal in it and i was like what? this will be good for me and it was disgusting oh, yeah no. i mean did nobody tell you that before you bought it. It's got charcoal in it. Of course, it's going like, to be disgusting. It'll be good for me. It'll be good for me. <laughs> yeah. Not everything like- that sounds disgusting <laughs> has to be good. You know, like it's, it's typically, I know it's like an inverse relationship between taste and health, but that's just yeah. taking me to an extreme. But I mean, we're not gonna <laughs> no, I, I really don't recommend charcoal lemonade. Charcoal. Lemonade. charcoal. That's yeah, good to know. Was enough. it black or was it still it yellow? Was, it was. Oh. Mm. It was straight up like that's black like too and much gritty. charcoal. It should have been like gray, like a light is gray. There, you know, is there a yeah. amount of charcoal in your beverages. Like, what's going on here, guys? What <laughs> yeah, it's like well, detoxifying. Charcoal. Yes, yeah, yes, it? they it to, yes. The hosp- yes, they give it to people at the hospital when like they're poisoned. Yeah, like so it pulls out like shit. metals and shit from your body or something. Oh my god! Also, just said <laughs> he brushes his teeth with charcoal. Interesting. Yeah, it's also oh, you whitens your that. teeth. It also whitens your teeth. Okay, okay, but I have to say, I have a couple dentists in my family, and I do need to say to Asif, you have to stop because it will degrade your enamel. Um, there you go, guys. Whole thing, that whole thing is a lie. You heard it here first, guys. <laughs> wow, awesome. my cousins are going to be so proud of me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> spreading that dental knowledge. It's oh necessary, God. man. It's necessary. Um, okay, next okay. is uh, a movie or a TV show that traumatized you as a child. Uh, the Witches, the original The Witches, rolled up. Yeah, it was spooky. It's one of my favorite books, though. Have you watched the new one? I have watched the new one. Not as good as the old one. Okay. I haven't watched Did you it. watch Maybe. the new one? I haven't watched okay, it Okay, sorry. Um, I what wouldn't. You- <laughs> oh, who, who, shit, okay. Who, was that like the Bette Midler one? Like Angelica who, Houston. No, Bette Midler oh, okay, was like Hocus yeah. Pocus, man. Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, this bad, was bad, like bad, based bad. on the also, book. Also, Kathy, Kathy Najmi is also in Hocus Pocus and she's Lebanese. Oh. oh. There you go. There you go. Early representation. representation. What up? Yeah. What nice. up? Nice. Um, okay, number four. And this has context because you just tweeted about one of the members. But what is your favorite InSync oh. song? <laughs> oh, um... Bye bye bye. It's a classic. Mm-hmm. And like I think, you know, also just got paid is really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I maybe throw that up on payday from time to time. Yeah. Bye 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 is great because it's got like such iconic choreography. Mm, that's true. You know, like everyone knows. Yeah. Yes. It's true. Yeah. It's true. I uh, am I question. prefer I couldn't I literally couldn't tell you. Other than those two songs, I couldn't tell you InSync songs because I was a Backstreet really? Boys fan. I was a Backstreet Boys fan, man. I I could I could name you like forty Backstreet Boys songs. I could not tell they you. One hundred percent Backstreet Boys have the better catalog. Yeah. Like in a versus, Backstreet Boys would win. I hate to say. Yeah, it, no, but... totally agreed. Totally agreed. That's a hot take. 
<laughs> is it? I don't know. I feel like everyone thinks this way. Um, Instinct okay. was like the one that we liked when we were kids because like all the members were like a little cuter or whatever, or like whatever that means. But <laughs> Backstreet Boys is like the gentleman's. The gentleman's <laughs> choice. And the, it's a little more mature. Backstreet Boys is the gentleman's choice. That is going on <laughs> yeah, a T-shirt. <laughs> Well, it's but, like a more mature sound. Yeah, I, and and yes. yeah, they were, and I felt like they were better looking. And then, like one of them now is like a Trump supporter, and you're like, this is why we can't have nice things. But otherwise, Which the one? best Brian. <gasps> yeah, Brian can't sing anymore. Karma. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's what you get, what? sir. Brian, yeah. what? Sorry, what happened with Brian? He can't. He's a Trump anymore? supporter. Oh. oh, he can't sing anymore. And and he has oh. vocal nodules. Yeah. It's very sad. Yeah, yeah. it is very sad. Yeah. But I mean, he had a great voice. He did. He did. Um, okay. And then the last question on our rapid fire that has taken not a short time. Sorry. Um, no, 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 no. This is so much more fun when we do That's it this way. Nice. Yeah. Um, okay. And lastly, what is your favorite way to eat potatoes? So, like, mash, <gasps> fried, fries, chips, poutine. What's your choice? First of all, this isn't my favorite because I'm not Canadian, but I think if I were, it would be my favorite because I would like get it more. Poutine is amazing. Like, good job, Canada. Um, however, yeah, Sophia has I have recently to be been honest. like putting that forward as an option, and I think it's specifically because either a she just really has been craving poutine lately, <laughs> or she's trying to get that Canadian representation in here. It's a I combo. I mean, genuinely, I I recognize poutine as the superior choice here. I have to be <laughs> honest, though, and say that I love waffle fries because mm. the crunch to surface area is, is like unbeatable. Yeah, and it's like it's like soft enough in the middle yes. that like yeah, oh, it's so good. Waffle fries are divine. Ideal. Excellent, excellent answers. Ten out of ten on, on that, all your answers. Yeah, that, that, that <laughs> Thank was God. Great. That was awesome. No report cards need to be ripped up for this. Yeah. One. A, <laughs> a, a plus <laughs> through and through. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Mama will be so proud. Yeah. I'm going to move into IB. IB. <laughs> <right>. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Amazing. Awesome. Uh, with that, uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us. This was amazing. Where can people find you and your work and also maybe the Pillars Fund and the Pillars Fund's work? Yeah, so Pillars Fund is at Pillars Fund or Pillars underscore fund on all platforms. Um, I'm at Eddie Jmikati on all platforms, including TikTok, but I never go on there. I just went on there and got the username in case I eventually decide to like <laughs> understand it. Smart. Um, but yeah, don't find me on TikTok, but you can find me anywhere else. Amazing. We're going to be tagging you on a bunch of TikToks it, probably in the next couple of weeks. So. Oh, gosh. You okay. I guess you I should redownload up. the app. <laughs> <laughs> You might Incredible. need to, yeah. Thank you again so, so <laughs> much. This was awesome. Appreciate it. Such a pleasure, y'all. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It was really fun to talk to you. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Halal Gap. Stay tuned for more episodes. The Halal Gap is a Moskers production. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok by searching Moskers Film Festival. Thank you to our sound and video editor, Arish Jamil, our tile artist, Narmeen Syed, and our producer, Asif Qureshi. Please rate us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, and if you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments about our podcast, you can email asif at themoskers.com. On behalf of Sophia and myself, thanks for joining us, and we'll catch you next time.